Welcome everybody, Patrick Norris here. I'm so excited you've joined us for our Red Ink Revival training around why do the sciences matter, particularly neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, and how they all work together with theology. It's a great question. In fact, we'll pose it this way. Is it spiritually responsible to utilize the sciences like neuroscience and psychology to help us understand theology? It's a great question that a lot of folks have thought they've internalized, but they've never known what to do with it. Another question for leaders is how does neuroscience, psychology, and theology help us understand wholehearted leadership? How does it help us with human behavior or emotional compulsivity? When we talk about this stuff, we have to understand that science actually means knowledge. It just means knowledge. So you can have good science or credible science, and then you can have science that has had bias go into the interpretation of it. We get all of that. In sciences, though, it's just knowledge. It's growing in knowledge. There's physical sciences, there are biological sciences, and there's psychological sciences. The physical sciences, of course, everything from physics to metallurgy, zoology and biology, all the way physiology, and psychological sciences, of course, psychology, all the way to even things maybe including economics. All of this is built, incidentally, on logic and philosophy. So anytime you're dealing with knowledge, it all begins with the assumption of basic principles in logic and basic principles in philosophy. When we talk about God as we merge with theology, we have to consider that there are two kinds of revelation from God. There is a natural, general revelation from God and a special revelation from God. The natural revelation is knowledge about God and spiritual matters discovered through natural means, such as observation of nature, the physical universe, philosophy, and reasoning. All of that fits in what's called natural revelation. We also have special revelation, which is knowledge of God discovered through supernatural means, which is the, the highest of which is, is inerrancy of the divine scripture. It's the authority of the Bible. So when we think of revelation, God is not limited to only one kind of revelation. He wants to give us multiple kinds of understanding of him. In creation, the Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. We also know by what the Apostle Paul encouraged us is for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. They've just watched up and listen, they've observed the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his qualities, his eter eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. So in other words, the Apostle Paul is elevating that there are things in the natural, there are natural sciences that help us even have greater insight to God. Now, before you pull the plug and think that this is heresy, hang on with me because I believe it will help you dramatically. When you think of the sciences, Timothy, Paul wrote him in this same regard of knowledge, and he says, Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. The King James Version calls it the sciences. He tells him to guard against it. And the reason the reason that it must be guarded against is because science and natural or general revelation cannot be put on the same level of authority as the revealed Word of God. So the Word of God is profoundly important to anchor us in our understanding or vetting of everything that we learn. And yet, in fact, the sciences can come along and give support to what it is of a spiritual truth that God is trying to get across to us. Dr. R.C. Sproul, he said this. He's, a, of course, a Reformed uh, theologian and philosopher. He says, I hold to the classical Christian view of the relationship between general revelation and special revelation. So what we just talked about, he says, I, I have a traditional classical view of general revelation and special revelation and the thesis that no truth of any kind can be discovered apart from God's revelation. With Augustine, Aquinas, and all of the Orthodox Christians and Christian leaders, Orthodox Christianity, I believe that all truth is God's truth. 
Now, the reason that that's being spoken isn't because that some other religion is threatening to us because they have some level of truth going on in their religion. That doesn't mean it's a threat to Jesus Christ, the inerrancy or authority of Scripture. It's not a threat to the Trinity. It's not a threat to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ or soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. None of that's threatened just because somebody has an element of truth. Yet one truth by itself may not always produce the kind of results that God designed. In fact, it does not. So again, R.C. Sproul, one of the leading theologians and philosophers of our day, he's passed away recently, he would say that general revelation and special revelation falls under the category of all truth, and all truth is God's truth. When we talk about this idea of science, there are these process-designed laws that God has placed into the universe. A process law is a series of events that takes place in any given circumstance with unvarying uniformity. When we talk about a series, we mean that it's a process, that there's A, that it blends in or adds into B, then to C, and so on. It is a series of events that takes place in any given circumstance. Doesn't matter the circumstance, it will have unvarying uniformity. Some examples of that are things like gravity, things like lift and force. So an airplane, an airplane is able to overcome gravity simply by utilizing other process laws. This is not, quote unquote, a miracle. It is all scientific. It is process oriented. And when those laws of, that make up aerodynamics are abided by, you will find an airplane flying. You also have electromagnetism, thermodynamics, biogenesis, chemistry, planetary motion, mathematics, logic, and uniformity of nature. All of this is built under process laws. It's a part of God's intelligent design. When we talk about God's intelligent design, we're talking about things that are organized, structured, systematic, ordered, harmonized, standardized, precise, interpretive, methodic, uh, methodic, predictable, accurate, definite, concrete, observable, analytical, scientific. What this simply means is that God didn't create a universe that is just random. It has precision, it has order, it's organized. And therefore, it can be studied, it can be analyzed, and in the observation of it, we can begin to learn some things about who God is and how he functions. Watch this quote. This is from Dinesh D'Souza. He says, the greatest scientists have been struck by how strange this is. There is no logical necessity for a universe that obeys rules, let alone one that abides by the rules of mathematics. This astonishment springs from the recognition the universe doesn't have to behave this way. It is easy to imagine a universe in which conditions change unpredictably from instant to instant, or even a universe in which things pop in and out of existence. I love how he uses language to help us think through that God created a universe that now then helps us to have deeper clarity as to the way God functions in everything that he does. Now we see Sean Carroll. He says, as a cosmologist at the California Institute of Technology, a law of physics is a pattern that nature obeys without exception. Again, another great quote. Here we have Richard Feynman. He wrote the, the Meaning of It All, Thoughts of a Citizen Scientist. He says, why nature is mathematical is a mystery. The fact that there are rules at all is kind of a miracle. I think that's funny. Now then, I want you to consider this from Paul Davies, a physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist at Arizona State University. To be a scientist, you had to have faith that the universe is governed by dependable, immutable, absolute, universal mathematical laws. That's a lot to say. Mathematical laws of an unspecified origin. Of course, that's a secular mindset from a Christian worldview. We know the origin. You've got to believe that these laws won't fail, that we won't wake up tomorrow and find heat flowing from cold to hot or the speed of light changing by the hour. Over the years, I've often asked my physicist colleagues why the laws of physics are what they are. And the favorite reply is, there's no reason they are what they are. They just are. 
And so what he's doing is he's talking about the impact of design, how powerful design is. When we think about the universe and God creating it, when God created the earth, if the earth had been sized smaller, it would be an atmosphere impossible to live in. If it was sized larger, it would contain free hydrogen, again, impossible to really live in. And if the earth was fractionally further from the sun, we would freeze. If it was fractionally closer to the sun, we would all burn up. If the moon was any different in its distance, the gra uh, gra gravitational pull would screw up. Things would go massively haywire. And then if you had Earth rotations, that it's interesting God designed it so it could be predicted that every 24 hours there would be a rotation. Again, when we're thinking about all of the design that God has created the universe with, we see this organization, predictability, it's rational, it's mathematical, it's built in logic. And notice what Dr. Emily Baldwin says, one of the most important numbers in physics, the proton-electron mass ratio, is the same in a galaxy six billion light years away as it is here on Earth. According to the new research, laying to rest debate about whether the laws of nature vary in different places of the universe. What I'm trying to do is drive home this idea that God is ordered, that God has designed, that God created everything from his nature so that it would be logical, so that it could be known, so there could be knowledge, so there could be science. If you take, for instance, the human eye, the eye distinguishes over 7 million colors. It automatically focuses on 1.5 million messages. Of course, in an intelligent design debate, we really struggle with the idea of how could that have just randomly come together and made to happen. Where DNA is concerned, it's made up of four chemicals that scientists abbreviate as A, T, G, and C. And then you see the layout of the code of how human cell begins to build an instruction manual. In other words, a DNA is full of programming. It's full of instructions that dictate and direct the way that cells will work and cells will function. One more time, what our emphasis is, is that God has spent immaculate measures to make sure that there is order, there's design, there's logic, it can be analyzed, it's methodic, it's something you can observe. It's knowledge, and knowledge is science. So when we talk about science in the Bible, the Bible often gives us general principles, however, science from experimentation, quantifiable observation, modeling, objectivity, and replication. It privileges us with intellectual and emotional depth in these textures, shades, patterns, dimensions, accents, and nuances of the principle. In other words, the Bible will give us a principle, but God assumes that there's going to be a measure of logic under the revelation of the Word. In other words, if you don't know how to read, you would never be able to process what in the Bible. Or audibly, if you didn't know what certain words meant when they were spoken, and these are extra bi biblical kinds of knowledge, that if you didn't know what the words meant, you could not process the revelation of God. Also, we understand when we read the Bible, Scripture tells us about the light of men. Well, that assumes you know something about light. We hear about the sower sows the word. Many of the parables Jesus taught utilize the sciences to give us an emotional and pattern depth to understand really what he's talking about when he's talking about the truth of God's word being put into our heart. We hear about the body of Christ, physiology. We have to understand some things about the body. So when he says every joint supplies, the deeper meaning is not just a physical mass, but actually order, design, functionality, something that is an analyzed and observed. Birds of the air. Now we're talking about zoology and we're understanding how they take care of themselves. And Jesus taught us about provision as we looked at birds. We hear about building a house upon a rock. Well, it assumes you know what a rock is to be able to do it or what sand is. When God talks about him being a fortress or the, the psalmist speaking of God is my fortress. Well, you have to understand construction. You have to understand design. You have to understand protection. You have to understand a fortress is much more than just some big mass of wood or some uh, concrete 
rock structure. You have to understand it as something that the enemy couldn't get past. And then the Bible tells us that the sun rises on the evil and good. So we're looking at the sun. What I'm telling you is, is that there is science, knowledge that often is a precursor. It's based in logic. It's based in a philosophical order and understanding. And yet clearly, I want to make sure that I emphasize clearly, whenever you look at logic or philosophy, it could never violate the truth truth of what we know in God's word. God's word is the anchor, it's the authority, it is the inerrant. Yet on the other hand, many times we have come to the word of God and we have assumed certain things based on our bias of interpretation. There are things even when it comes to natural sciences that for many years there were folks who believed things about how the earth functioned, that the earth was the center of the universe, that, uh, that the earth was flat based on various texts. And what science did is allowed us to review the text without breaking the authority or inerrancy of scripture and yet changing our interpretation so that it fits more healthfully with what science is. So what I'm saying is that science has a place. Science matters. When we talk about the natural sciences, I think you would understand that. But many people come to psychology and philosophy, and then it's like, well, this is a completely different science. This is skewed. It's filled with bias. There are so many things in it that are corrupt and toxic. Now, let me just say, there are many things over the history of psychology and psychiatry. There are many things even in philosophy where people have gotten it completely wrong. That's why it is important to build your life on the Word of God, the inerrant authority of Scripture. When the Word of God is what you're built on, then what science does is augment. Science comes along and helps you see clarity in different kinds of ways, but it should never violate the truth that is God's Word. When we talk about psychology and philosophy, we do have some of the same corresponding principles as what we had when we were looking at the previous slide around the natural sciences. God made the natural universe physical and biological so that it is organized, predictable, standardized, precise, measurable, constant, observable, and scientific. Wouldn't it be plausible? Now think about it. Wouldn't it be plausible that social, psychological, and philosophical systems would be capable of being observed and scientific also? So if it is observable, if it is scientific also, if you do have order, if it is something that can be analyzed, if it is something that can be observed in all of its different unique nuances, and there can be knowledge pulled out of that and probabilities brought to the table so that we can predict, I, I want you to understand that does not mean that everything in these particular disciplines are going to necessarily be accurate. Sometimes in research, there are biases going into it. Sometimes there are people who are bent on whatever their previous belief systems are, and they're driving home a point. Some of the questions that are asked, some of the, the coding, some of the ways that it is gone about can be, can be flawed. And so we always want to live by the word. But I do want to build up the esteem of the scientific community. That in fact, that within the disciplines of psychology and philosophy, there are some very sincere people who have no agenda but to find out exploration. And which, it's interesting because this is exactly what the scientists of the past have done. In fact, most science probably wouldn't even been explored if it wasn't for people of faith. Christians, Christian scientists who believe that God created a universe that had order, that could be observed, that was mathematical, that could be logical, that could have philosophy behind it, and from that be able to explore freely the universe that God created. Well, I just posit that when it comes to psychology and philosophy, not all psychology, not all philosophy is healthy or right. I've come across much that is not. But I'm grounded in what God has said. I'm grounded in the truth of the word. And so the exploration now, it can be very much like a kid in a candy store. It's like, oh, wow, did you see this? And oh, wow, did you see that? It really can be something that adds to your knowledge, not take away from your knowledge. Whenever we read about, for instance, Jesus telling us about the Father, God, God being a Father, what we have is a construct of relationship. 
relationship that now connects to attachment, connects to emotion, connects to service, trust, vulnerability, so much. Even the story of the prodigal son, the story of a relationship between a father and a son who's gone wayward. And we see all this emotional dynamic, everything from loss and grief to a, a child who is not aware of the decisions that they need to be making and then their own loss and grief and the, the tension around, can I go back to my father's house after I've embarrassed him? And the father waiting on the porch for the, the son to come home and then the celebration, the party of when he returns and the way that that whole uh, reconnection and, and restoration happens. It's just an amazing story. All of that is predicated on some understanding as you read the story of human relationships. And some people who've never had healthy human relationships or they never had a healthy relationship with their father, they would be somebody who would struggle a little more to see the depth of this story. And so I again posit that this storyline and many of these things that are listed help us get a deeper insight to the Bible because of a psychological order and because of the way logic and philosophy works. The Good Samaritan, another relationship text. What about the, the 59 one another's in the Bible? 59 times one another, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another. All of those are social. They're emotional. They have a psychological component to it. The Bible tells us a merry heart does good like a medicine. And what we see there is a way for the heart to be able to connect with health and strength. And from this one text, we have to have, we have to have some understanding of medicine. You have to have background of what medicine is to actually get the greater understanding of what a merry heart will do for you. When the Bible talks about the armor of God, and he talks about taking the shield of faith to quench fiery darts, the fiery dart is a dart that was specific in the Roman arsenal that had a combustible tip. And when it was shot at impact, it would explode with fire. Fire throughout scripture has a metaphoric representation of intensity of emotion. So the idea of the whole armor of God is the enemy's coming to you with these fiery darts to inflame your emotion. And in inflaming your emotion, he can kill, steal, and destroy. Again, fiery darts being associated with emotion, now then it's something that can be studied because psychology is actually the study of the soul. We go on down to roots of bitterness springing up and defiling, or even the word lust. Did you know that in scripture, the book of James, uh, James says, let nobody say when they're tempted, they're tempted by God. But they're tempted when they're drawn away by their own lust, by their own lust. You do a deep dive into the Greek and you see that it's the word epithemia. And epithemia is a word that in classical Greek and secular Greek was representative of an intensive, uh, an intensive emotion or rage. Now what's interesting for me is in my studies around psychology and philosophy, I've come to know that rage is what's considered observable. It's organized. It's something that in the pattern of multiple hundreds and now thousands of case studies, that rage is behind all maladaptive, addictive, and compulsive behavior. Well, if you deconstruct what rage is in the way that you watch the patterns of human uh, behavior, you'll come down to that rage is actually built on the foundation of shame, that shame moves into a fusion with loss of control, moves into a fusion with panic in one moment. And at that moment, there is this anger energy that drives a person to the temptation to do what they do. So when James says that you're drawn away by your own lust, he's talking about regulation of your emotional inner world. This would be true of leaders. It's true of husbands and wives. It's true of all of us when we're dealing with any behavior of our lives. And so this epithemia helps us get insight to things that were in the secular world. And today when we study psychology, which is the observation of human behavior, we begin to say, oh my gosh, when James said that, he didn't just mean what I had a bias in my religious background, the limitations I had in my uh, in my religious background, it actually means so much more. When the Bible talks about love, that the greatest commandment is to love God, love others as you love yourself, 
It's interesting because, again, in psychology, we believe that all human behavior comes down to shame, and shame, at least negative behavior, uh, uncontrolled behavior, comes down to shame, and then shame is built on this idea of fear. Shame is the fear, I'm not enough, I can't be enough, I don't belong, I'm not worthy, I can't be seen, no matter what I do, it doesn't make it better. Shame is a circuitry in your neurobiology that is driving you to try to fit in, to try to be a part of a greater community. So Jesus comes along and he says, the way you live healthy, the greatest commandment is that you would love God. And in loving God, you begin to experience his love to you, which means it's non-performance oriented. You do not have to perform. That leads us into this idea that because I don't have to perform, now then I can love myself. I can be kind to myself. I can be compassionate to myself, which reconstructs my circuitry, what happens in the anterior cingulate of the brain where empathy and compassion are concerned, now then bypasses the amygdala, which is where my fight, flight, freeze is. And that makes me now then have a regulated emotional circuitry that I can actually love others well. Well, everything I just said was built in a greater depth. The, the textures, the insights, the color, all the commentary that went into what I just said was so informed by psychology and neuroscience. And what I'm saying is, is that it never ever should contradict the authority of Scripture, but if it doesn't contradict, it certainly will add to it. And then the Bible tells us that out of the heart proceeds, out of the heart proceeds, Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and so on. So what is the heart? When we begin to dig into what the heart is, how that it's a fusion of the born-again spirit, if you're a Christian, and the fusion of the born-again spirit with the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, when you begin to see it that way and look at it from the neuroscience perspective of what the limbic system of the brain does, all of a sudden you begin to see new aspects of what not only is at the surface of the text, not only of what is in the literal of the scriptural text, but perhaps what might even be much deeper insights to the text than what we've ever thought or discovered before. So the point is we don't violate scripture to be able to trust science, but we begin to trust some science because we have this ultimate trust in the authority of scripture. When we think about observation and science, we have to go back and think about Solomon. Solomon had his observations in the book of Proverbs. He talks about social chemistries. These are all observations. That means that God created social constructs. He created emotional constructs. He created so much. Of, of what he created in the interpersonal soft skills world so that we could know how to trigger new series of events so that we can have new outcomes with unvarying uniformity as well. Now, what I love about the book of Proverbs as we go through this is the book of Proverbs is actually what a king would tell his son or what a king should learn as they're growing up to become a king and to sit in the king's chair. The reason I say that is the whole book of Proverbs is about leadership, kingship, is about using authority. And he tells them about, uh, tells us the observations of social chemistry, human propensities, God's works and ways, subtle alluring patterns of temptation to get you off, behavioral consequences, seed forms of violent crimes, sure pathways to regret, patterns of deceit, spiritual measures that prevent sin, man's futile plight in the fallen creation. And ironic complexities in navigating life's events. All of these things that Solomon writes about is so that we would have an internal understanding as to why we do what we do. They were all observations. They were all looking at the natural interactions of humans and people and outcomes and taking the aggregate of it all and then narrowing it down, straining it to a principle that we could live by. I think that is absolutely amazing. Now, when we think about research in a secular way, Today, we have famous people like Brene Brown. She is a shame researcher. Now, I want you to consider how she observed, what it is that she went through. She had 1,280 interview participants before she ever did her first TED Talk and before all of her books were written. 
She coded 11,000 incidents. These are phrases and sentences so that she could see patterns of behavior. Now, I don't know what Brene Brown's spiritual life is like. I know in her writing, she talks about going to a church. I don't know what her relationship with Christ really is in its depth, but I want you to understand my loyalty is to the Word of God and my admiration is to people who've studied things who help me understand maybe deeper ideas of what the Word is about. A few moments ago I talked about how that you're drawn away by your own lust, your epithemia, this rage at the very bottom of the rage is shame. And when you begin to study some of the uh, outcomes, some of the principles that Brene brings, you are just, it's staggering how helpful it can be to your inner world to know how things play out. A series of events, process laws, a series of events that takes place in any given circumstance with unvarying uniformity. John Gottman, he's considered the relationship researcher and expert that is one of the top 10 influencers in the world of human relationships over the past 100 years. Years. He studied relationships over 40 years, particularly married couples. He has a, a way now of with a 94% accuracy predicting the success or failure of a marriage based on particular principles like the predictors of does the relationship have criticism? Does it have contempt? Does it have defensiveness and stonewalling? As he looks at those factors, he can determine whether or not somebody is on the trajectory towards divorce. Divorce. Again, with a 94% accuracy. To me, that's staggering. He used research methods like interactive behavior. Uh, he dealt with perception uh, principles, physiology principles, and interviews. So what I'm saying is, is all of this is where they looked at patterns. They looked at outcomes. They looked at observations. I'm not at all suggesting to you that John Gottman is the authority of God about relationships. What I am saying is, is that when you see some things in the Word of God, you come back and you learn some things in psychology or the observation of human patterns, and when you do, you begin to learn about why we do what we do. Even in relationships, we learn what causes us to flame out or what causes us to bond and connect. And as we find those things out, we don't elevate somebody like John Gottman to the level of the authority of Scripture but certainly, there is an, an enormous amount of insight that we gain that the Bible already is talking about, and yet we never knew because we had this box limitation of what that particular text or verse meant, when it could have meant a whole lot more in the mind and heart of God. We just get the basic principle. The same is true, not only for Brene Brown and John Gottman, but Andrew Newberg. I don't think Andrew Newberg is a religious person. He may be an atheist. Uh, he may be a universalist. I, I'm not sure where he falls in his faith journey, but he is a neurotheology researcher. So he's using brain scan technology and he begins to study what happens in the brain when people interact with various disciplines. So he wrote an entire book on how uh, when people were hooked up to brain scans, they would do their spiritual disciplines from worship to meditation to declaring God's word to even the Pentecostal speaking in tongues. And he wanted to see what parts of the brain would light up and what would happen. Interestingly enough, in the research, and this is combined now with a research from Baylor University, 72% of Americans believe in an authoritarian, critical, and distant God or a punitive God. 72% of Americans believe that God is punitive, authoritarian, critical, or distant. 23% envision a God who is nurturing, forgiving, and kind. But this group also believes that God will respond to them in anger and sometimes cause suffering and pain for them. What that means is there are 95% of the people who call themselves people of faith who ultimately jump into a punitive God scenario. Watch this last line. Dr. Newberg in the Baylor study found that a punitive interpretation of God actually damages the brain and devolves adherence to poor mental health. Well, if you understand that the majority of Christianity, even teachers and preachers, 
even in my fraternity of teachers and preachers of the gospel, they often teach and preach that God is authoritarian, critical, distant, he's punitive, or they believe he's good, but he's also chaotic in that he confuses them because sometimes he does good, sometimes he creates very horrible and uh, difficult situations in their life for some mystery of wisdom that they have never been able to figure out. All of that damages their brains. What I'm saying is, is that we don't use science to elevate to the absolute truth of God's word, but all truth is God's truth. And if we have God's word and something can come beside us and then compel us to look at a text in a way that we've never looked at a text before, like God is always good. So if God's always good, what do you do with the book of Job? What do you do with Paul's thorn? What do you do with Jesus being led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? What do you do with the Old Testament God? who is judging Israel, and Moses has to talk him out of his rage because Moses in the moment appears to be more humane. Well, the issue is, is if we have some science, if we have some things that now we are seeing that is compelling us to relook at the text, maybe our interpretation of the text has not always been accurate. Maybe we took the short route or we just lived in the bias of our previous generations rather than looking at the text for what the text says. So science then becomes very helpful in all of our entire journey of learning about God and his word. Thomas Aquinas, he, of course, is a uh, a Christian theologian and philosopher from around 1224 A.D., and this, this is a statement I want you to get. The division of theology into natural and revealed had its roots and writings in the Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas. In an attempt to apply Aristotelian logic to the Christian faith, Aquinas emphasized man's ability to comprehend certain truths about God from nature alone. However, Aquinas maintained that human reason was still secondary to God's revelation as taught by the church. Aquinas was careful to distinguish what could be learned through natural reason from doctrinal tenets, calling the truths gleaned from nature preambles to the articles of faith. And of course, this is in Summa Theologica, the first part, question two, article two. That is, reason may lead to faith, but it cannot replace faith. Natural revelation can synthesize human knowledge from every area of science, religion, history, and the arts. I want you to to just get wind of the idea that this has been going on for centuries, that we don't discount or disqualify psychology and philosophy just because it's psychology and philosophy. Just because it's secular does not mean that it loses its power. I think it would shock a lot of Christians to even know Jesus used terminology of the day, like the word apostle. This is fascinating, the word apostle. Most people hear this word apostle and they assume what it means is uh, that Jesus hijacked or created, he was the innovator of a brand new term and he's like, I'm gonna call you an apostle and go now do apostle things, I'm gonna send you. So anybody who says, what is an apostle? Well, the word means a sent one. That's, that's just not very clear. But you know, in history, in Rome, they would send an apostle as the senior delegate with a whole team of people from the arts, from areas of culture, uh, like to the sciences, people that were educated and academic, people that carried all parts of what makes up a culture, from medicine and so on. They would go in as a team, and they were sent into regions to culturize the region to be Roman to create a Roman culture. So Jesus takes the word apostle, the word apostle, and says, you guys know what that means in the Roman culture. I'm sending you now to go into the world with a delegation, and you're going to culturize the earth with the kingdom of God. Well, again, Jesus took a word that was secular. There's nothing wrong with using secular ideas as long as they don't trump the word of God. So, again, as we move along, Scripture and nature are mutually interpreting for each other. Mutually meaningless without each other and mutually fruitful with each other. You can't understand the Bible rightly without some general revelation, and you can't understand nature rightly without the illumination of the Bible. And again, what I want to do is help each of us see that God has a bigger picture. 
When it comes to philosophy, when it comes to philosophy, this is so important because I do periodically get pushback around that we should not have any secular philosophy because, you know, everybody from, you know, Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, they were all evil and they were all corrupt. Time out, time out, time out. Read this with me. The Apostle Paul was trained at the school of Gamaliel. Gamaliel's school encouraged the careful study of Greek philosophy, which is Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, for those of you who don't know, Aristotle was a student of Plato. Plato was a student of Socrates. And I want you to see that Paul was deeply educated in Greek philosophy. Out of the 27 books, epistles, and letters that make up the New Testament, 13 have been authored by the Apostle Paul. And this doesn't include the book of Hebrews, which many believe that he wrote. The peoples of Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica, which he wrote to, were all a part of the Greek-speaking world and educated in Greek literature and philosophy with their own gods, traditions, and opinions. What I find is interesting is that there is a lot of association when you read Paul's writings and compare some of the exact statements that Paul makes, compare that to some of the exact statements that Aristotle made, some of the exact statements Plato made, some of the exact statements that Socrates made. Even when Paul is in a Greek area, they are worshiping their gods and he introduces them to the unknown God and he quotes from the Greek poets, the Greek philosophers. It's fascinating when you see that Paul was not intimidated by philosophy of his day. And there is logic, there is training in how you approach life and how you even understand things. There are certain ideas that Paul gained long before he ever had a vision, before he ever understood the Bible, before he ever understood redemption. Now, once he understands redemption, once he understands what Jesus did, who he is in Christ, he now then elevates that to his highest authority. And so he doesn't adhere to these ph philosophers and the things they said as the inerrant and the authoritative. He just says if it makes sense, if it all is logical, observable, it has a uniform outcome, then I'm not going to reject it. I'm going to use it for the benefit because all truth is God's truth. I will interpret scripture using logic, but I will not allow logic to overcome the authority of scripture. Now, finally, when we talk about these things, there are people who will say to me, is there really such a thing as inner healing or soul healing? I thought the Bible teaches the renewing of the mind. So, Within Christianity, there are various preachers, various leaders and voices who will say, you shouldn't ever, you shouldn't ever try to utilize any of the philosophers, any of the logic, any of the philosophies of centuries gone by unless they were Christian. And I would suggest to you that, that that's, again, uh, irresponsible. Uh, so much of what we know today, so much about what we teach, so much of our understanding of God and life has been enhanced by science, and now we're talking philosophy. I hear people criticize it, and then I'll hear people say, well, there's no such thing as inner healing. And I get, I get that there are a lot of uh, uh, silos, groups of people within Christianity who say things, put it under a heading of inner healing, put it under the heading of soul, he soul healing, and it has its own unique brand. They do their own unique things. And if I'm honest, some of the things that I hear and see, I'm like, yeah, it's not, I, don't, I can't align that with the word. It doesn't seem to be beneficial. Uh, I, get, I get all of that. And yet, on the other hand, when we talk about inner healing, what are we talking about? Some people will say, no, the Bible doesn't talk about inner healing. It talks about renewing the mind, renewing the mind. And I get, I get the context, but I just wonder, like the madman of Gadara in the Bible, he was a demoniac, and when Jesus cast the devils out of him, the Bible says he sat in his right mind, his right mind. Well, could you say that there was now a healing of his mind? I don't think that he had a renewal of his mind with the scripture renewing his mind. Like most people would reduce renewing the mind to you only can renew your mind to scripture. But if he's sitting there healed and he is delivered and he's in his right mind, could we say he had a healing of his mind? So I suggest to you, this is just an issue of semantics. Semantics. 
If we're talking about restoring the soul, if we're talking about renewing the mind, so and incidentally, I don't believe you renewed your mind until your mind has an emotional circuitry of compulsivity towards what you are believing or what God's Word said about you. In other words, renewing the mind doesn't mean you memorized the text. Renewing the mind means that it's gotten down into your inner psychological world. Now, see, that sounds so mysterious, so vague and invisible, and yet in brain science, we would say that it's the reprogramming, the reprocessing of memories, of emotions, of thoughts, and where they come from, how there is a root of bitterness that springs up and defiles, how that you can have the enemy inflaming you in the way that you think. We have a whole series of ideas in Scripture that tell us about the spiritual side, and yet in the the neurobiological side, we see that it happens in the brain, where it happens in the brain, and so you can draw correlations. So my suggestion to you about renewing the mind is that we're not, we're not in a battle against each other. If you don't want to call it inner healing, don't call it inner healing. If you don't want to call it, you know, something like soul healing, don't call it soul healing. Call it renewing the mind, but the process to get there, whatever you want to call it, the process to get there means you've got to do deeper work and allow yourself to recover from the neuro circuits, uh, the places in the hippocampus, places within the amygdala, places within the anterior cingulate, places within the limbic system of the brain that have been so damaged through loss, through grief, through Adam's sin that we all inherited, through perpetrators and through our own choices and losses in our lives. What I'm trying to say is that it is critically important that we learn how to lead with a whole heart. Lead from a place that is in strength, not from a place that is just in, I'm just doing the best I can, I'm just disciplining myself, I'm white knuckling, trying to do better. When we talk about leadership, this is what Solomon would say, the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Now get this, you've got to stay with me just a few more minutes. Understanding, understanding. It is a word that simply means to separate mentally and to apply. In other words, if you have understanding of a thing, you're able to distinguish anything around it. You're able to separate those things mentally and you're able to apply it into your everyday life. So it's taking the knowledge and applying it. It says that wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, you got to get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding because she will honor you. Wisdom and understanding, knowledge will honor you. When you think about what the Bible teaches around leadership laws, we know that there is a mission that is critical. The Bible tells us that we ought to live by a purpose. Jesus lived by a purpose. The Apostle Paul here says the most important thing is that I complete my mission. And so as a leader, we understand some things about a mission. Then we understand some things about a vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. We understand the importance of alignment. When the whole body's joined together and knit together, every joint supplies, the whole body will grow. So alignment. Then we have the idea of reward, that you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. The labor is worthy of the hire. What I, what I want you to see in this, this whole four-bullet piece is that all of these give you the idea, but what if you could have greater knowledge through observing multiple hundreds and even thousands of case studies and see patterns, see things play out. And so if it's true where it comes to things that are hard skill issues like developing a mission, a vision, creating and executing the alignment and making sure there is reward, all of these are more of those hard skill issues. So when you think of hard skills as a leader, you think of systems development, you know, values and standards, team building and delegation, the whole list that's here, how you financially manage your organization. Now, this is where I'm driving you. When we come to soft skills, why do you communicate the way you do? Why do you listen or not listen the way you do or don't? Why do you struggle with feedback the way you do? Why do you get flooded with emotion when somebody gives you uh, a feedback? What about situational awareness, emotional intelligence? What about adaptability? What about energy, focus, empathy, magnetism, tolerance for change? These are just a short list of soft skills. I just want you to know at Red Ink Revival, what we want to do is help you learn what's going on in your neurobiology, what's going on in your psychology and help you lead from a wholehearted place of peace and joy and freedom.
Make sure you access all of the resources at redinkrevival.com. We love to run the journey with you. Be sure to hit up our podcast. It'll all be launched in 2020, and we'd love to see you there.